super funky what we did just a minute ago. But let me let me tell you what it is. It's biblical. It's biblical. It's biblical that we see needs in the community and we meet them. And it doesn't matter if it's deer meat. It doesn't matter if it's food, groceries, right? Money, whatever it is. And sure, there's people that take advantage of the system. There's people that, that refuse to help themselves. And Paul addresses that. But then there's people who genuinely are going through life and getting a point in need. And like I was talking to my buddy the other day, if you can't go to the church, where can you go? Right? So it's an honor and a privilege to serve God in that way. Well, guys, I'm excited about what the Lord has for us in, in uh, his word today. First, though, I want to uh, let you guys know that this is my twin sister. Are we twins? Oh, no, I was four years older. That's right. This is my sister, Bailey. Everyone say, hi, Bailey. Hi, Bailey. This is her husband, Bon Quiqui. Everyone say, hi, Bon Quiqui. <laughs> Kyle. This is Bailey and Kyle. And my beautiful, beautiful niece, Haley, and i got another beautiful niece that's in the nursery named Raylan. And they are in from Tennessee, and we are so glad to have them here. And I love you, Bailey. All right. Um, check it out. If you're a guest here this morning, this is your first time here, um, and we've got some people that are here for the first time, I want you to know two things. One, you are safe to be here. You're safe in all sense of that word. You are physically safe, you are spiritually safe, and you're emotionally safe to be exactly who you are. Um, and there's no, everyone here may look pretty, but all of us are messed up. And that's why we're here. All of us are broken. All of us are this close away from losing it. One choice. I'm celebrating four years sober from methamphetamines uh, this coming February 14th. And I, tell, I told my friend uh, I was talking to the other day who had four days. Doesn't matter if it's four days or four years, you're one choice away. And it's nothing but the grace of God and the power of God that keeps us on our feet and going every day. And so I don't care if you're an uh, ex-prostitute or drug addict or drunkard. I don't care what you are. You're safe here. And you're safe to be who you are. Secondly, it's our church's job to serve you. So me or the deacons, the deacons' names are on the back of your bulletin. Uh, my phone number's on the back there, and if there's anything we can do to serve you and your family, let us know. All right, guys, let's get in. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I hope you do, please turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. Jerry, it happened again. We were going to be in Luke chapter 11 today, but God's got us in Philippians chapter 4. Chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7, a very familiar passage. If your body is able and you are willing, please stand in the honor of reading God's word. Are y'all happy to be here this morning? Yes. Amen. All right. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray that you sanctify us by your truth. And thy word is truth. So God, take us where we are at and move us to where we need to be by the power of your word. Speak to our hearts today. Come be with us. Father God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a seat. So the only way that I know how to handle spiritual matters, um, how to handle growth in my life or in this church's life is just to be real. So with your permission... And the fact that you guys have let me stay on this stage, I'm taking it as your permission. I want to be real for a second. Okay, number one, there are people in this community that are hurting right now. Right now as we speak, there are people who lost loved ones this last week. Um, grandpas, dads, you know, I mean, this, 
Ed Blakely and Kurt Brower both were fine men, and their families are hurting, rightfully so, because of the love they had for them, they're hurting. Um, we've got people in our community with drug addictions that they feel trapped in, and they can't get out of them. They just can't um, on their own power. And the wake of that, it ripples through families. I caused my mom and dad just horrible pain and heartache. We've got people in this community that feel like the church is too clean of a place for them to sit in a pew. We've got people in the community that have told me firsthand that I can't go sit there because so-and-so is going to say this about me. And the truth is, I want to say this right now, is no matter how good we may put on our look, and we should, we put on our dress, we clean up, we smile, how was your day, it was good, how are you, I'm good. But if we were honest and we could scan this room right now, we would see that all of us are in a state of need from God right now. We need God. We need God in our marriages. We need God in our families. We need God for the brokenness that we have in our community. We need God. And we need the real God. We don't need the prosperity God that is not the God of Scripture. We need the real God that says, though there is sorrow and tribulation, take heart, because I've overcome the world. Though there is pain and suffering, you can take joy in that pain and suffering because that pain and suffering and that trial is building something inside of you. We need that God, that God of the storm, to come be with us. So before we move any further, I want you just to try to shake the dust of church off of you, shake religion off of you, and let's just get real. Let's get real right now. Let's get into God's word with an acknowledged need. Can we agree on that? All right, let's do it. So in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, this reveals to us a very familiar passage that we've heard a lot. We see it on posters. We see it with little kittens hanging by one paw, you know, don't be anxious for anything. It's a, it's a good quip. But let, it, let, the, let not the familiarity of this scripture blind us from the powerful truth that lays there. And guys, if you're like me, the second you're on the verge of growth, the second you're on the verge of something good, it seems like the enemy just brings a stinking avalanche on your head. And guys, this is where I've been at. I want peace in my heart and in my life. I want a marriage that is defined by peace. I want to father my kids in a fatherhood that's defined and operated in peace. I want to walk through the trials of this life with peace. So in order for us to truly grab a hold of that, we've got to dig into what God has for us today. All right. If we were to scan and truly assess our world and our church here today, one thing that we'd be evident is that there is an absence of peace in our life. The absence of peace, hear me, is a visible condition that can be seen in our attitudes, our actions, and our choices in our life. Where there is no peace, there is fear and worry. There is a steady flow of chaos that is counterproductive to the purposes of God. I can understand I can understand why there's riots over political agendas. I can understand why there's social uh, unrest. It's because there's an absence of the presence, presence of Jesus in their life. And you know what? They're lost. And the lost are acting lost. I can get that. I, I can get that when I walk into a community and I see the ones that have not the peace of peace in their life. I understand why they're that way. The lost act lost. I get it. But what puzzles me is when those who are called to live in peace begin to live in anxiety and fear. Those who are found act like they're lost. That's what puzzles me, even in my own life. Anxiety causes all sorts of, all sorts of things, according to research. Here, put a little checklist in your life right now. See if any of these ring a bell. Anxiety causes a fear to act, uh, hesitation seclusion, depression, discouragement, unwise and harmful decisions, physical sickness, spiritual backsliding, distrust, and unbelief. 
You need that ringing true in your life today? Sometimes the church has to be reminded of what it should look like when we live by peace. Why? Because there's a lost community that's watching us. I remember being the drug addict, drug addict on the street, seeing these people walk into church. And I remember telling myself, I want what they have. I want what they have. And we've got people that are watching us. We've got kids that are watching our marriages. And we're trying to tell them to believe in God and to live by peace. But when they see mommy and daddy, they see nothing but distrust, disunity, dysfunction. We're trying to give drug addicts a, a hope and get them out of the streets. But when they look in the church, they see nothing but judgmental criticism. There's an absence of peace in our life right now. And I see it. I've been in the homes of, of those who were hurt, and I've, I've met with the family members. And it's amazing when you talk to someone in the valley of despair that has Jesus Christ. It's amazing. They have something about them. It doesn't make sense. And then you meet someone else, another family member that's in the same family, same problem, same valley, but they have not Jesus. And there's nothing. There's no hope. No comfort. And for some reason, we have the answers as Christians, as followers of Christ, and yet we refuse to live by the promise that God gave us in his word by peace. Paul had to remind the church here in Philippi a couple things. He saw that they had real-life circumstances that were going down in their community, their church, and their families. And the people that were supposed to live in the peace of God were slowly beginning to live in the fear of the enemy. Paul had been beat. He had been stoned. He had been whipped, scourged, scoffed, hunted. But he knew the key to peace. He knew the key to peace was delighting in the Lord. Paul delighted in the Lord, and because of that, he was able to live his life regardless of the circumstance and the peace of God. I want to I I read you something I wrote down. To delight in the Lord is to consistently pursue and contemplate the Word of God with the intention of direction and obedience. Hear me. To delight in the Lord is to consistently pursue and contemplate the Word of God with the intention of direction and obedience. That's what we're going to do today. We are going to identify very quickly four truths of God in this text that will give direction on how a Christian should be when they are one that lives in peace. Let's start at the very beginning, verse 6, the first part. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything. The first truth today is anxiety has no place in the life of a Christian. Anxiety has no place in the life of a Christian. The word anxious means to fret or to worry. It's an indication of a lack of trust in God's wisdom, sovereignty, and power. Do you realize your anxiety is an indication that you do not trust in God's wisdom, sovereignty, or power? The Philippians were beginning to worry, and that worry was starting to affect their faith in God. They were beginning to doubt God's power and doubt God's sovereignty. Can God really use this in my life for my good? Their life was a mess. Paul knew it, and he knew according to the world standard that they had every reason to be anxious and worry. The Philippians were suffering persecution for their faith. They had people in the church that couldn't get along with one another. And as a result, there was a growing spirit of animosity between people. They had false teachers coming in and attacking the cross of Christ. The Christians there at Philippi had physical needs that weren't being met. There were Christians in the church of Philippi that did not have food, clothing, or shelter. So yeah, put all that in the pot and they had every reason to be anxious. But they were not called to live a life according to the world. They were called now to live a life in Christ and through Christ. They had God within them. Matthew, I'm going to read this to you. Matthew 6, 25 says, Therefore I tell you, Marion, hear this. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Paul is telling them back in Philippians 4, 6. He's saying to them and to us today that the same God that clothes the wildflowers and feeds the sparrows, the same God who spoke creation into existence, the divine source of resurrection power, the author and finisher of faith lives inside of you. So Paul says in the beginning of Philippians 4, 6, he says, therefore, do not be anxious about anything. That God lives in you. God is greater than your situation. And God is the provider of all that is good. And he lives within you. Do not be anxious. Anxiety has no place in a Christian. Paul doesn't just tell them how not to be anxious or tell them not to be anxious, but then he goes on and tells them how to not be anxious. Let's read the rest of 6, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, you learn not to fear and worry about your life and the life of others by going to God with everything in prayer. Isn't that a hymn? Take everything to the Lord in prayer. Why do we underestimate the power of prayer? New believers out here, if there's any of you that are just learning to walk in the faith, let me tell you, the best and number one reflex that you have as a Christian is your prayer life. That's how we practically get by day to day. That's how we get through the sorrows of life. That's how we get through the confusing times in our marriage. That's how we get through the time when our daughter dies or our son dies or our dad dies or our mom dies. We get through it with the power of prayer. Do not be anxious. Anxiety has no place. Number two, a Christian should remain in a constant state of prayer postured by a spirit of thanksgiving. Let's unpack that statement. All right, verse 6. Verse 6 says, but in everything, in everything, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, right? But then he says, but in everything. Well, everything means however small, however significant, whether it's keys or cancer, it means all things, everything in your life, especially those things that bring you anxiety and fear. Weren't we in Romans 8, 28 last week? I think we were. Remember, remember in Romans 8, 28 when uh, Paul said, he said, uh, but God, he said, but God uses, for we know that God uses all things. And remember how we said that all things was all things? Like all things was even your thing, right? And my thing, God uses all things. It's the same, this is the same Greek word here when Paul says, but in everything. You could say, but in all things. It's synonymous. Paul uses, or says, give everything to God because we know that God uses all things. All things. Give everything in what? Paul tells us. Give everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Prayer used here in the Greek refers to a conscious, hear this, a conscious, deliberate communion with the direct purpose of worship. Prayer is a conscious, deliberate communion with the direct purpose of worship. When's the last time you prayed to worship? Prayer and supplication. All right, supplication is a big church word. Here's what supplication means. Supplication means to ask. When I go to my mom and I'm like, hey, mom, I need to supplicate you for five bucks. <laughs> That's, that's, that's the same thing as saying, hey, mom, can you, can you spare five? To supplicate is to ask. Paul says, take everything in prayer, which is a conscious, deliberate communion with the direct purpose of worship. So, God, I'm going to come to you to commune with you, to worship you, and I'm going to take whatever it is, right, because it's everything, so I'm going to take whatever it is, and I'm going to bring it to you and ask you to take it. He says prayer and supplication. Supplication refers to prayers that focus upon special needs. You know that whole deal of, uh, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Hey, would you pray for me? I'm going to pray for you. Special needs. We may feel a deep, intense need for God, so we go to him in prayer and we supplicate. But the curveball here is when Paul says do this, to pray and to supplicate. But he says that as we are making our requests known, as we are making our requests known, 
we are to do it with what? Thankfulness. Well, golly, it's hard to be thankful right now. Do you not feel that way? Like I, That always puzzled me. Okay, I can understand going to God and, and being God, okay, I'm freaking out. But Paul says, hey, go ahead, freak out, but do it with a level of thankfulness. Right? And why? Because thankfulness puts you in a posture that allows the power of God to work in your life. When I'm thankful, I'm postured in a way that allows me to have perspective on my situation, however big or small. The word thanksgiving, when translated, refers to a state of mind in which we thank and praise God for all that he is and all that he has done. Okay, so maybe you can't be thankful for your cancer, but can you be thankful for who God is and what he's done? Can you look back at your life and see the fingerprint of God? God, thank you for being who you are. God, thank you for the very breath in my lungs that brings these words to you. God, thank you for being who you are, good and unchanging. Do you realize, though, your life is a constant storm of chaos, that God is unchanging? Like that truth is so profound. Even though my world is spinning right now, God is constant and unchanging. There's always something to be thankful about with God. The reason Paul included this idea of praying and supplicating God with the spirit of thanksgiving is because thanksgiving postures the heart for perspective. When we are thankful, we're no longer focused inwardly, but rather we are focused on that which we are thankful for. So when I'm thankful for God, I'm no longer fo focused necessarily on what I'm bringing to God but rather I'm thankful for God, so therefore I'm focused on God. Paul knew this. Paul understood this. Paul lived by this. And in verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that if they could obey God by refusing to be anxious and take everything to God in prayer, with a spirit of thanksgiving, then they would receive the blessing of verse 7. The third truth that we can glean from this text this morning is a Christian through obedience can have access to supernatural divine peace. That a Christian through obedience can have access to supernatural divine peace. Verse 6 is an if statement. Verse 7 is a then statement. If this, then that. If you respond to the circumstances of life through obedience to God's word, then you will receive a peace that will carry you through your circumstance. If you submit to God, then you will receive the peace of God. Verse 7 says the peace of God. The word peace here refers to inner calm and tranquility, but not of human effort or origin. Paul says the peace of God. This peace has origin in none other than God. It's the peace from God. This is the peace of God. This is the divine nature of God. The origin of this peace is the third realm. Think about this. I ain't getting all hippie on you. I'm just being serious. Do you realize there's multiple realms operating right this very second? Do you realize that if God could remove the veil from our eyes, we would see the spiritual warfare that is happening right now around us? That there is something going on beyond us right now, this very second, there is a divine war waging for the glory of God. And Paul says, listen, what I'm promising you does not come from your realm. What I'm promising you does not come from the peace of Wall Street. No, what I'm promising you comes from the third realm. It comes from the third heaven. It comes from outside of time, space, and matter. It is the peace of God. And it'll come to you. <sighs> Paul said it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's a fancy way of saying uh, it blows my mind. Seriously, have you, never, have you never sat down with somebody and just been like, how are you doing this? How, how are you? Like, how are you okay? Like, it don't make sense. Like, your whole world is crumbling down around you, and yet you're Okay. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it does not, it does not compute. 
Paul says we are incapable of understanding it. Therefore, our only choice is to experience it. That brings me to my fourth and final point today, and I will give it to you in two minutes and 42 seconds. <laughs> it's 1158 if you're wondering. Number four, God's peace has a purpose for your life. There's a purpose for God's peace. Verse seven says, the purpose is, is it'll guard your heart. It'll guard your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God has direct purpose and application for your life and how you live it through faith. The word guard here, in the original language, it's a military term. It means to garrison. It means to keep watch over. Listen to this. Divine peace guards the believer from fear, stress, discouragement, and depression. Paul says that it'll keep watch over what? Your heart and your mind. Paul uses this idea of heart and mind not to separate the two as different entities, but rather to give a comprehensive statement that refers to the whole inner being. Paul saying it's not just going to guard one area of your life. It's going to guard you from the tip of your head to the bottom of your soul. It's going to guard your heart and your mind. It's going to guard everything in Christ Jesus the peace of God watches over your life and all that you are, the whole inner being. And then in closing, Paul says, in Christ. It's interesting that he would add that preposition and that noun, in Christ. This is only available. Check it out. It's only available. This peace, it's only available to those who are in Christ. Those who have repented of their sin, placed their faith and the person of the works of Jesus Christ confessed him as Lord or boss of their life and believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead. To those, to those who are in Christ, this peace is available. The peace of God is a result of being in Christ. Only those who know him as Lord can know his peace. The fact is that we are called to be ones living in the peace of God, to live and function within the divine peace of God as our call, as believers, and it shows faithfulness in who God is and who we are in him. I'm going to pick on Jody because Jody's like me. Whenever we start getting our lives cleaned up and we start getting serious, we start realizing, okay, I need to learn more about this God I'm serving. So, Jody, check this out. My journey revolutionized when I realized not only is there an identity of God that I know nothing about, but there's a new identity of me that I have identity in Christ, that the Blake I identified with my whole life was completely inaccurate and wrong and bears no weight on the reality of who I am now in Christ Jesus. The more we know our identity in Christ, the more we know what we have available to us as heirs. As our invitation team comes forward, let me leave you with this statement. When we are living in the peace of God, we are delighting in the Lord. As a result, we are no longer focused on ourselves, but rather we are consistently engaging God and his word with the intention of direction and obedience. Direction and obedience. It's not the word you know. It's the word you do that changes things. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, if you just need prayer, today, if you just got some storms going on in your life, and it doesn't matter the details, you just got some storms going on, and you just need prayer right now, just raise your hand. Amen. 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 God, I pray for those that raised their hand just now, Father. You know every single circumstance that surrounds them in their life. God, you know every area of pain, suffering, and anxiety that's infiltrating them right now in their life. So, Father, first and foremost, I pray that those that raise their hand would know you as Lord. Because none of this matters if they are not in Christ. So, God, I pray that if they are not in Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation and they would place their faith in Christ, repent of their sins, and confess you as Lord. And by doing that, God, they would walk in a new identity in who they are.
But, Father, those that raise their hands, if they are in Christ, then, Father, I pray that they begin to live in the peace that's available to them. And all it requires, Father, is them taking their anxiety and whatever situation is causing them anxiety and giving it to you, Father, asking you to take it. Thankful, Lord, that you are who you are. And you tell us in your word, God, that if they do that, then then they will have a peace fall on them like a sweet, sweet rain. And it'll be beyond their ability to understand. And it'll leave one pointing back to you. So I pray that that happens today, God. I pray for everyone else, Lord, because there's going to be 100% decision made today. I pray for everyone else in this room. Father, you just be with them. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. As as we sing, if you guys want a special prayer.